Hello and welcome back to Star History Blitz. My name is Mrs. B. Gonzalez and we're going to continue with our 8th grade social studies curriculum. Today we're going to be going over the ratification debate and the Bill of Rights. Here are some key points that we'll be reviewing in this video session. Now, during the Constitutional Convention, the Founding Fathers really took their time in creating this new, strong federal government. And it was time to ratify this Constitution. And ratify means to approve. However, during this time, you get two groups of people that are for and against approving this new Constitution. Now, the Federalists, they're all about a strong federal government. They're ready to ratify to approve this Constitution. They believe that a strong federal government will create stability in the nation. They're led by the main leader is Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. They even write a series of essays known as the Federalist Papers to try to convince America that, hey, this is a good constitution. We need it. We've really, you know, worked hard in creating it so that there's no government abuse, right? That it's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. However, you get the anti-federalists. So think about that word anti means against, right? So if they're against the federalist and federalists want a strong federal government, then they're against a strong federal government. They're ready to go back to the Articles of Confederation where the power was at the state level, where the states had their sovereignty. They wanted that. They were led by George Mason and Patrick Henry. So they were all about, no, we don't want this strong federal government because we are afraid that they're going to abuse their power. And so this debate went on back and forth and back and forth and every time, you know, George Mason would say, your, your president is really just like a king. The Federalists would come back and say, no, because of limited government, because of checks and balances, right? And so um, a lot of debate going back and forth until finally the anti-Federalists said, we don't even see in this constitution our individual liberties protected. We want a list of our liberties protected. And so they asked for a bill of rights that has amendments that protect those civil liberties. And finally, even though the Federalists said, okay, the Bill of Rights isn't necessary because it's a government of the people, but the Federalists said, specifically James Madison, I will write you a Bill of Rights if you ratify the Constitution. And that's what they did. The anti-federalists said, yes, we will approve it if you add a Bill of Rights that will protect our individual liberties. And that's what they did. And so our Bill of Rights are 10 amendments, right, that they added that protect our individual liberties. The First Amendment actually has five parts, freedom of religion, assembly, press, petition, and speech. Now, remember that a lot of these amendments have to do with grievances, things that we experienced, complaints that we had when we were ruled by Britain. For example, freedom of religion. Well, a lot of people who founded America came because they were escaping religious persecution. So they said, we never want to be in that situation where we have to escape persecution again. So give us freedom of religion. Freedom of assembly. The king had dissolved those representative assemblies. That was a grievance they had. So they want to be able to have the right to get together and, you know, for a common purpose. Freedom of the press. They want to be able to be informed about what's going on in the government. Uh, petition. They want to be able to tell the government, hey, we don't like this because of this reason and have those signatures. And finally, freedom of speech. They want to be able to speak without fear of getting punished. The Second Amendment, right to bear arms, because they didn't have the right to own weapons. Uh, the Battle of Lexington and Concord happened because they were going to go seize those weapons and supplies that the colonists had. The Third Amendment, right not to quarter soldiers, because they used to be forced to quarter the soldiers. So they want the right to say no. Now, I want you to take a look at the next ones, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All of those fall under an umbrella 
of rights of the accused. If you are accused of a crime, you have certain rights, okay? So we start with the Fourth Amendment, and we have freedom from unreasonable search and seizure. If somebody, if a police officer shows up at your house, they need to have reason to believe that you have something in your house to be able to search it. That reason is a search warrant. So they cannot go in there without a search warrant. Why did we add this one? Because British soldiers would go in and search for smuggled goods or any items that you hadn't paid taxes on. The Fifth Amendment is due process of law. It protects citizens who are accused of a crime. It assumes that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. That means you have the right, for example, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can or can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to an attorney. That means you have the right to a legal counsel. If you don't have one, then the government will give you one. All of these are rights that you have as a citizen of the United States. You have the right also against double jeopardy when you're when you're tried for the same crime twice. You have the right to remain silent if you are being asked a question in court that might incriminate yourself. The sixth, the sixth and seventh amendment go hand in hand, right to a fair and speedy trial. You also have the right to trial by jury. The eighth amendment, no cruel or unusual punishment. The, the punishment must fit the crime. If you were caught shoplifting, then you're not going to go to jail for 10 years, right? If you were, if you got a speeding ticket, then you shouldn't pay a million dollars. So also no excessive fines, no excessive bail. The Ninth Amendment protects individual rights. Not all your rights are going to be listed here. There's so many. And the Tenth Amendment goes back to the principle of federalism. The federal and the state share power. That means that states have rights as well. And that's your Tenth Amendment. And remember, federal and state, five and five. What does it equal? Tenth Amendment. So federalism, states' rights. This concludes our last session on government. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next one.